So, one more time, hello, and welcome to the webinar uh, on Ukrainian culture in wartime, artistic and pedagogical uh, perspectives. My name is Olga Presich, and I am an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies uh, at the University of Victoria. Uh, I would like to begin with a, a territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge and respect uh, the Lithuanian people on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Eskimo, and Sanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, this webinar has been uh, organized by the Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies with funding from the Ukrainian uh, Studies Legacy Fund. Uh, which has been established by the Ukrainian Studies Society of Vancouver Island. This event was uh, uh, conceived when we found out uh, that our Ukrainian uh, colleague Katerina Yakovlenka uh, was organizing an art exhibit uh, in her apartment destroyed by, uh, by the Russian rockets. Uh, Katerina had previously visited our university in 2017 when she spoke uh, at a conference about Ukrainian culture. At first, I thought of organizing just a uh, Katerina's talk uh, accompanied by some uh, visuals, uh, but it is equally important uh, to articulate how our academic field needs to change under the impact uh, of the war and the uh, cultural responses to it. For this reason, uh, Katerina's talk will be followed after a brief Q&A session by a panel of, of four academics, uh, Michael Fowler uh, of uh, Stetson University, uh, Yulia Ilchuk of Stanford, and two UVIC professors, myself and Sergei Yakelchik, uh, will talk about how the war is uh, transforming our teaching and our research. This panel will also be followed by, uh, by a short Q&A session. Uh, I, I would also like to thank our graduate student assistant, Alicia Gajar Fleming, and our media support specialist, James Gavro. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be uh, posted on YouTube. Mm. In order to ask questions, please, type them uh, in the Q&A box, which opens uh, by clicking Q&A icon in the lower part of, um, of your Zoom window. And, and please uh, start um, typing your questions as Katarina speaks. Uh, and this way we will have some um, questions ready uh, when she talk is over. Okay. Um, uh, Katerina Ekalenko, uh, who is originally uh, from, the non from the now occupied part of Donbass, is um, in recent years uh, emerges as one of Ukraine's uh, most talented young art critics. Uh, she has done some outstanding work uh, as a curator uh, and also uh, distinguished herself um, as a perceptive journalist, but um, she truly became a celebrity now uh, after her apartment um, in Irpin near Kiev has been left in ruins after a Russian attack. Katerina made a very powerful artistic statement by curating an art exhibit in what remains uh, her place and the media coverage uh, has been outstanding. We are privileged to have secured Katerina as a speaker for our event. Katerina, for your words. Thank you, Olga. I'm really delighted uh, to participate in this conversation. Um, and being a guest of the university. Um, and I want to show the presentation which I prepared for this uh, talk. Uh, but also I, I will start um, with a couple of other examples. And actually, 
uh, maybe with a situation to just dis to discover more the situation in which all the cultural workers and artists uh, have been since uh, February 24 and many of them, uh, of course, as many people uh, at, in general become speechless and try to find uh, to rethink uh, their practices, their knowledge, uh, everything that have been done before. Um, and just to find uh, new words to describe what is going on, new place, wh where are we now, and from which perspective we are speaking. And lots of questions uh, come up uh, dedicated to the culture. Like, for example, um, when culture and arts have to um, come to this territory where was an, uh, the war and violence was, is it? have to be done after the war will be stopped or it have to be done immediately right now, uh, just at the same time when this violence is going on. And when I was speaking with Aleftina Kahidze, she was ensuring me that the arts and culture uh, is always presented in the society. There is no uh, another uh, options. This is just a question what kind of culture and arts uh, we are talking about, how this art and culture works with trauma and especially with a very fresh trauma. Um, and what is interesting to me, uh, what kind of aesthetics and ethics uh, in relationship to this trauma have to be done and uh, what kind of work uh, with trauma um, we are doing right now. Um, and as I said, like really lots of cultural workers, curator asking the same questions and trying to find answers on it. But um, I will show you a couple uh, examples which are um, currently presented uh, in Kyiv. And of course, I'm sure that there is lots of other examples and maybe some of them not uh, very well highlighted in the society. Uh, but this uh, too is very interesting to me. Uh, first one is Ukrainian Emergency Art Fund. Uh, this is uh, NGO organization that have been emerged uh, since the, uh, 24th of February, and they are collecting all the artworks uh, that created after that. Uh, they're working as archive, but also as a platform for discussions, they're creating exhibitions and so on. And one of this um, very short exhibition uh, was made by Boris Filoninka, originally Kharkiv-born curator, uh, and it's called Other Parts uh, in the Next Quarter. And this exhibition is about the abstraction, is um, when the curator asks uh, what kind of abstraction do we have now? And actually this, the very same question I asked myself and I found very interesting answers that for me, abstraction is not abstract anymore. It's like very connected to the context and it has a huge narrative. And uh, what is more interesting, it's very connected to the different violential acts. And this artwork was made by Katya Buchatska um, as also uh, a very long uh, process of, of thinking. Uh, she met uh, full-scale war in the um, Museum of Palatka, uh, Paraska Plitka Huretsvit in ivano frankivsk region, and she had uh, this personal attachment to this first day um, to the uh, war. Like, for example, she, she didn't uh, see um explosions she didn't heard sirens on the first day but so but but also she was thinking how she could be how she could reflect on this experience um and then she moved to lviv uh, and start looking for uh, artistic materials and she find out that there is no ukrainian materials anymore all this uh, factories that produces uh, um oil uh, that was destroyed by Russian so soldiers. Uh, and then she again starts thinking how, what she could do and how she can work with that because she cannot use Russians materials, for example, anymore. And she um, find out that the oil is created from the land. And when she come back to the Kiev, uh, she took the um, uh, land from the Bucha, Moshun and Hastomel from the craters and she creates this uh, oil uh, by herself. 
And one painting is uh, called uh, Bucha, and one is Hastomel, and one is Moshun. So as you see this abst abstraction, which doesn't look like a narrative painting, but it has a huge story, very deep, uh, deeply connected to the trauma, uh, because the materials created from this uh, very specific land, which has already this memory about the violence, violential acts and uh, war, and loss. Uh, and this, uh, another uh, artwork from this ex exhibition, it's made by Katya Buchatz, uh, Katya Lipkind, and she usually works with drawings. Uh, and as usual, her works is very emotional. And this is actually um, uh, the title of the exhibition, The Other Parts in Another Quarter. And for curator, uh, Boris Filoninka, this is about time and the place. Uh, doesn't mean that all um, everything that we have now is the last parts of this story. Doesn't mean that we will find lots of very important details in the future or in other space. So he, he asking uh, about how we can uh, find this language and find uh, solutions for working with our tri trauma. Is it have to be done right now or this is uh, long time processes uh, which um, would be made uh, during the next decades and maybe not even decades. But for me, it's also very uh, connected to the uh, physical um, uh, reaction that it's really about bodies which we find out in one place, in another place. And such, um, it, of course, it's not a very abstract work, but this is open up uh, very general and important questions about uh, our art history and history uh, itself. And two more um, artworks from this exhibition, uh, it's um, a photography documentation by Andrei Rechinsky, who stopped doing his artwork, uh, artworks and mostly focusing on volunteering. Uh, he helps uh, as also being born in Kharkiv, he start from the early beginning, uh, raise money for uh, militants, for civilians, but also he, uh, as a photographer, he didn't stop making uh, photo shootings and he just uh, document everything around. And for him, abstraction is how our society and with a language of uh, like numbers of like signs of streets uh, have been changed and all our um, um, I, uh, the architecture itself was changed, how the society uh, and how war uh, shaped uh, all our understanding of being presence in the time uh, in our cities or even in um, social networks. Because for example, when I was speaking with uh, Zhenya Moller, who is a uh, Ukrainian uh, also art critic and uh, researcher, she said, uh, and she mostly focusing in monumental art and mosa Soviet mosaics in Ukraine. And she told me that uh, they delete all the information from their website just in the reasons of security, because they were scared that Russians will find all these materials and will use it and will um, shell uh, or like destroy all this heritage. And another uh, artwork, which is not actually an artwork, but this is text made by Yaroslav Futimsky, who uh, completely stopped doing his work. But what he's doing, he's restoring the buildings and houses uh, in Chernihiv region. So each uh, week uh, for uh, 12 hours per day, he go in with his friends to Chernihiv and to Sume uh, just to make a construction work. And uh, for me, it's very important. And I think that this is like really uh, most powerful his performance because he is as artist who works usually with performance texts and uh, um, uh, conceptual art. For me, it's like really powerful uh, performance because this is a gesture of artists who choose his uh, way of uh, resistance, his way of uh, communication and um, support uh, to just ordinary people who need this support. 
another exhibition is um, uh, made in um, uh, Hanenkiv Museum. And the first uh, time this is exhibition was open just a uh, uh, couple of days before the full scale invasion. And it's a personal exhibition of Oleg Kalashnikov. Uh, and what he's doing, he working with uh, Soviet uh, toys uh, with soldiers, very small one. And this exhibition full of this such toys. But what is the difference between the first exhibition, first version in Kharkiv and the second one is that the Hanunkiv Museum was uh, full of different artifacts and artworks uh, from the collection of um, uh, Bogdan and Varvara Hanenko. But they uh, hide all these artifacts and artworks uh, because of security reasons. So all these museums in, is completely empty. Uh, so they, um, so while you go into this exhibition of Oleg Kadanov, you see all these empty shelves and empty walls. Uh, we still that still having uh, titles for uh, old armory or uh, old artifacts. So uh, this is two layers of uh, um, th that exist in this exhibition. And also they uh, put a text by Serhi Jadan and Yevhen Stasinevich. Uh, and this text covered uh, glass shelves um, that uh, before have all these artifacts. Um, and all this reflection by uh, Jadan and Stasinevich shows uh, the situation and uh, open lots of uh, question, not only um, about the connections of violence and the uh, culture itself, but also the place of the person in this, uh, any person of this conflict, how um, how your perception is really completely changed because of war, how you can see all of these toys and how you can, uh, what kind of interpretation you can give them. Because uh, be before uh, no one didn't recognize this as uh, something very serious, but looking now to this uh, Soviet uh, small soldiers, uh, you might see or like, anyone might see all this power uh, of empires that have been uh, going through different um, fields and especially very connected to the education and the uh, entertainment uh, and culture field as well. And uh, the last example is my exhibition, which I made in Erpin in my apartment. And I was like thinking a lot if I, should I have made this exhibition for whom, uh, who is the audience? And I was really scared that maybe I shouldn't invite any people to this because I didn't know how this space will work for them. Uh, but then, um, and that's why I, I didn't even make an uh, event in Facebook. So I just post this announcement as a post and uh, image. Uh, and lots of people start uh, reaching me and asking how to visit it and is it possible to see it next day or even months after that. But it's impossible because the, um, the specific of this place is that this is a private apartment that still exists in the building which have a lock and uh, the territory is also locked. So it's impossible to come any other time. So it's like very specific uh place and also the construction is not uh going right now so it's uh sometimes it's even very dangerous to be there if uh, there is a huge wind because our roof is destroyed um but then i also was thinking what kind of work i have to put there how it's uh, related to my thoughts and how it's related to the context as well um and I decided that I shouldn't uh, make any narratives uh, dedicated to the personal stories because uh, the place itself has this personal story. Um, and I was thinking, uh, and actually the most uh, important question to me uh, is the life after this ruin, how this ruin have to be um, uh, looks in the future and what we should do right now to, uh, rethink this ruin in the future. Um, I start uh, with the idea, an image of tree, 
which is in Ukrainian culture is a tree of life as well. The one of the important um, images. Uh, but also I saw these uh, pictures and collages by Sasha Kurmas, who was uh, documented uh, Irpin in Bucha and Hastomel uh, since March. And, and, and this is like really uh, documented uh, the real image of what uh, what was destroyed in Irpin. And of course now um, there is lots of images of buildings, but it's also important to tell that the wood itself, which is um, one of the specific, uh, like one of the main character of this area because the city is um, situated on the um, wood. Um, and this wood is also have been destroyed, not destroyed fully, but you can see how this uh, trees uh, was born or cut it uh, because um, artillery strike. So you, you see uh, these broken uh, trees and they also have, of course, the memory of this violence. And to me, it was important to, to think how long this uh, memory and how uh, the landscape is um, commemorates this trauma and how this all works with a uh, personal experience. Uh, and then uh, I found uh, lots of other works in Ukrainian um, art history and also very recent artworks, uh, which rethink this idea of uh, tree of life uh, very differently. Like for example, Tamara Turlun create uh, collages uh, where she um, saw how these trees and houses are falling and they become crosses, but then when they fall into the land, uh, they can, uh, after a, a lots of, after, after decades or after some times, uh, to you know, become a new tree, which is um, very connected to the idea of uh, Anna Zvagintseva, uh, uh, whose work is called uh, to plant the stick. And the idea is that uh, when you put the stick into the land, uh, after some times it could become a huge tree um, and new life uh, comes through it. Um, and actually this work uh, is not connected to this war, it's connected to the grandmother of uh, grandfather of Anna Zvagintseva and she was making this uh, as a commemoration um, of him as a, as a memory of him. Uh, but after all, uh, this work becomes something bigger and it's become commemoration of um, something important that have been lost. Um, so I choose this work uh, as a metaphor for, um, for the idea of life after the ruin. And also um, she puts a small notes um, to this uh, photography uh, from the uh, 60s, Nana uh, Chederovo Bazlista Stoyit Dushamo Yavpolyak, which is, describes all this emptiness and um, speechless, I would say, uh, and frustration maybe that lots of people uh, was feeling in the beginning. Uh, it was, uh, the room, uh, the bathroom in the corridor uh, was um, having the perspective and the search for language. Uh, and it's uh, also very small um, artworks. Uh, the first one uh, made by Mark Chahadaev and he meets uh, war in uh, being in Vienna as a student. Um, and also he was asking himself how he can speak about the war. And then because he has in the, his practice, lots of connection to his uh, private space and room, he starts thinking about the tragedy, tragedy as uh, water coming uh, to his room and filling uh, all this room. And he looking uh, at this um, catastrophe from the um, high walls or like uh, from the, uh, having this up um, perspective and cannot do anything else. And for him, it's also some poetical metaphor of uh, how, he, how he can speak about the war because he thinks that he cannot 
uh, speak about it directly and shows uh, uh, the people tra tragedies because he didn't present in Ukraine, but also he can uh, somehow rethink this uh, experience because he have a mother and brother whom he took to Vienna from Kyiv uh, since March. Uh, and also he has a lot of friends who was uh, suffering um, all this time. And another work, uh, it's uh, Katya Buchatska, whom I mentioned earlier, she was uh, in Venice uh, in Biennale and find the letters um, in the streets. And she starts uh, writing um, about her ability uh, he lost ability to speak and to find right images uh, because all the images to her didn't work and each wave of water comes and destroyed uh, her text and she was trying again to um, write about her um, emotions and her um, questions and like for example she wrote Deity as uh, many of you were seeing this uh, sign and they, this is didn't work for um, Russian army. So they still were shelling and they still was uh, um, destroying these uh, places. Uh, so it's the words is didn't work. So she's uh, trying to find this correct uh, sentences and correct explanation, uh, how we can name it, what is uh, going on, how we can... Um, with uh, which words we can describe our experience, how we can talk about war and how we can show the war in uh, art as well. And the last part is kitchen, which is dedicated to archive. And it has two works. Uh, one work is uh, by Ro Roma Mikhailov. This is actually the one work uh, which was, uh, which survived in my collection because the artist didn't give me back this artwork. And this is also not about the artistic value of this work. It's not about uh, the artistic value of this author. This is just about the coincidence which was happened. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, white and blind spots in Ukrainian art history. And this is also the, not a coincidence actually, because it's, the lots of violential acts was destroying the um, cultural heritage and it's still destroying. So we have not much uh, that we can eyewitness right now, like seeing in museums or seeing in uh, galleries. Um, and it, this is like very problematic because when we go into um, um, international audience uh, and we have the conversation about our uh, history of art, they asking, but you don't have anything. Yes, it's true, but let's see what is going on on the background of this, why we have not anything and what this loss is uh, mean to our culture. And I was completely rethinking the idea of loss. It's not something romantic. Uh, the ruin is not romantic. Of course, we have lots of uh, paintings which are romanticized the ruin, very beautiful. But for me, especially right now, ruin is very material. Uh, ruin is about the violence, about destruction, and about uh, imperialistic uh, politics, um, which come uh, to us and trying to rethink our history as well. And the second artwork, it's a Syria, which called um, Meta Botanica by Anatoly Stepanenko. He uh, is artist who started his career in 70s. Uh, and I come to the idea of invite him uh, because of his uh, previous work. Uh, he worked in a lot in um, different spaces in Kyiv in 90s. The first work was made in Kosei uh, Kopanir, the um, the place uh, was dedicated to the military and armory and infrastructure, but another work was made in uh, um, Kyiv Mohila Academy in early 90s, and it wasn't um, 
very beautiful as it now. It's like very really was destroyed and uh, forgotten place. So they come with artists and start working with this specific site specific materials. And he put uh, a tree and make installation with a tree. And another installation was dedicated to the archive. And he shows um, footages uh, from the 20s. And I was thinking how I can repeat it. But then he proposed uh, to show this uh, archive, which is ongoing uh, project to him. And he um, collecting lots of um, different materials, like found materials. Uh, you can see this um, bottles with uh, again part of the toys, uh, but also some uh, animals. Or um, but also he uh, collects this and compares this with the personal history, uh, like documents of him, um, hair or uh, clothes or something like this, and this is also show this like huge archive which connected with very obvious and uh, domestic and ordinary life uh, but also somehow have artistic value because he creates and rethinks this um, uh, everyday life experience and uh, the main um, question and like not, not the main question but uh, one of the work which is repeated in each uh, part of the exhibition, it's uh, made by um, uh, Stas Turina uh, and it's called uh, Thank You. And so he wrote uh, Thank You differently in different uh, uh, pieces of papers and even not papers like this is um, Salfetka. I forgot how it's. Uh, Paper napkins. Yes, thank you. Uh, with the paper napkins. So, he, and he write this uh, because he really thankful and grateful to lots of people who are doing something right now, who um, uh, who ready for um, being united, who ready to help anyone. And Stas itself, he um, usually volunteer a lot and he has uh, with his partner Katya Lipkin they have um, community of artists with and without syndrome of down and when the full-scale war started they helped uh, uh, hospitals to evacuate uh, people there so he was like really acting a lot and um, he still uh, still a very active uh, in volunteering movement uh, just an ordinary person, uh, just as an artist. So he like drawing this uh, thank you and given randomly to different people just as an act of uh, gratefulness. Um, and to me, it's also very important because the title of this exhibition was Everybody is Afraid of the Baker, but I'm Grateful. And it's taken from uh, my diary, which was um, performed in Berlin. And one of the organizers, uh, she said that this is too sensitive to her because the story of the baker is what uh, it was is about this everyday um, experiences during the war. The baker was coming to our supermarket to make uh, bread um when his village was already occupied so he uh, i would not say suffers but it was like a huge risk to his life um and i'm really thankful to him that he did this uh, small gesture uh which i also see as a powerful artistic gesture um, um yeah so this is the end um and I maybe uh, also have to add that each time when I'm seeing such um, very simply uh, made uh, artworks, I didn't see um, that for me, it looks very broader and uh, coherent with all the discussion which are happening right now. And to me, um, lots of people are really trying to take part in uh, resistance and being involved in this resistance some of them doing artworks some of them um, taking part in construction works 
uh, but all of them uh, making this as a personal decision to uh, find um, find their place in uh, future Ukrainian um, state, which is created right now. And uh, this is like, this is for me. It's a conversation about how our future and our society. Um, should looks like uh, after the war. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Katerina, for your outstanding presentation and, and also for your powerful personal and artistic statement against the Russian aggression. Okay, let's see. Do uh, we have question, some questions for you? Uh, Alicia, please. Um, yeah, so we have a question from Yulia Ilchuk. Um, she says, Katya, it looks like the setting is very important to the perception of this exhibition. If you were offered to exhibit your art objects in the museum space, what adjustments would you make? I'm actually thinking that such exhibition could be done in such space. Of course, you can bring all of these uh, elements to the museums, but perhaps it, wasn't, it wouldn't work uh, because the space itself become an installation. And I even was thinking, should I mention Russian Federation as an artist? Because the um, whole space like really looks like an installation, all this like broken uh, walls and uh, broken roof. Um, but then my friend said that it would be too strange, but it's really about being present in, um, in the artwork. And I think that for museum, maybe it should be done something else because all these white walls giving you um, more clear uh, background or... Um, not maybe clear, but uh, just just giving you another experience of the artworks and all these artworks would not um, uh, have this context perhaps. Uh, so I think that the place is really important in this. Uh, but talking about archive, uh, I'm thinking that it's really important issue to raise right now to collect uh, lots of works uh, because for one hand, of course, we are taking care and trying to take care about our heritage, but we also have to think if, while we're thinking about the future, about the future museum of future, what kind of artworks have to be there and how we can uh, talk about war uh, with all of the materials that we have right now. Thank you so much. We've got another question um, that might be better to ask like at, at the end of the thing, but I could just, yeah, well, anyways, um, it seems like a lot of the artists that you mentioned as well as yourself, um, like what you just said, you're, uh, there's a focus on collecting and on documenting this. So it seems in some way that artists are doing some of the work of historians. So this is just sort of a question for, I guess, for everyone, um, for yourself, uh, you know, how does your study of history uh, affect your art? And for the teachers and pedagogues here, how does uh, art affect your teaching practice? Perhaps uh, I have to start with that. Um, I actually was uh, talking about this um, specific issue in Ukrainian art, the connection to the history with Valdemar Tatarchuk, who is Polish uh, artist and curator. And he mentioned that he didn't meet uh, such powerful uh, artworks in Poland, for example, or in even in other uh, Eastern um, Europe that uh, work with memory and with past and the history as it makes by Ukrainian artists. And after 2014, after Yevra um, Maidan and war have been started, lots of artists uh, start really rethink their connection to the 
uh, history and history of art. And for them, it's important because um, seeing these um, similarities, um, it means that they're not alone and they do not start in the processes from the early beginning, as we always think that we all the time started something from the beginning, but it's not. Um, and then, of course, in, in 90s as well, it was lots of artworks which uh, was rethinking, especially Ukrainian avant-garde. And for Ukrainian artists, it's uh, the most interesting case because lots of biographies are hidden and um, lots of artworks was destroyed. And for them, it's also the question how they can work with this uh, traumatical experiences as, and uh, with history itself. And what is the place for them in this history? Um, because they also think maybe more uh, general about being present in uh, history. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to? Oh, Serhi, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, tour de force uh, presentation. Um, my question is actually about what is next for the apartment because you transformed it into an art place after the Russian army transformed it into the ruins. Can you imagine uh, the kind of a place it, it is going to be one day when the entire building is uh, restored, if this is indeed the intention? Will there be traces um, of this exhibit left? It's a very provocative question. Uh, I don't know. It's a question, of course, uh, uh, very difficult because uh, we're still uh, trying to understand how to make construction uh, more correctly uh, because we didn't have, uh, we have three um, uh, analysis of our building and we still need to do one more. And the last analysis was saying that we can save the building, the first one that we have to destroy the building at all. So. It, it's a question to the architects as well uh, and how they will uh, create this plan of reconstruction. Uh, but as for me, I don't know. I was asking the same question when I was standing there uh, and when all of these people whom I even didn't know was uh, walking through my place. And for them, uh, I was see seeing this difference that for me, it was still my apartment, even it's have nothing to do with that. Um, I mean, it still have because of documents and because of the law and responsibility. But uh, for many people, it was just uh, an exhibition in a very interesting place. Uh, and it was interesting to see how this ruin looks like uh, from inside. And I didn't find solution. I didn't know if this, uh, if this space was completely um, transformed to the gallery or it's uh, just a transition because uh, for now I'm feeling like uh, I'm not owner of it, but owner is the birds and uh, butterflies who are coming to this uh, space. And just when I come to the um, to this place on Friday when the opening was, uh, I saw how these birds was inside uh, my space and I was like, asking myself, should I now asking permissions to these <laughs> birds to enter this uh, exhibition? Uh, but it's like really interesting how it's changing all the time. And of course, I hope that we will um, make a roof and the building would be saved. But if something goes wrong, perhaps even the well, walls would be created. destroyed and uh, we can uh, rebuild it uh, with other uh, bricks or other materials. So it maybe it would be just another uh, place. Thank you. And I think we have one more question from, uh, from Mayhill C. Fowler. 
Sure. Um, thanks so much, Katya, for this amazing, um, amazing talk. I was taking so many notes and that slide that you had of questions are sort of precisely what I'm talking about in my remarks. So thank you so much. Um, and there are many questions, but um, the, the big one, I think, is, you know, this panel is so much about how artistic and pedagogical practices have changed. And so as you've told us the story of this journey that you have taken personally and the way that you've taken it through your work, right, and through creating this exhibit, how have your artistic practices changed? Or have you seen in the community of artists the ways that practices have changed? I know that's a big question, but just your thoughts. Well, it's like really changed even since February, it's changed. Uh, in the beginning, I was seeing that lots of artists cannot do anything, but then they find this uh, different ways of uh, talking. Um, and I would say that the main, um, the main maybe um, reason is that they didn't uh, see the end point of this journey of questions and uh, searching like languages and forms because they're trying to find uh, right words and right uh, messages. Um, they could do, uh, they can experiment a lot. And I'm thinking that this is like really gives us um, interesting, like this is creates uh, interesting artworks because you can do any mistake because it's not a question about mistakes. It's just the questions of this um, um, intellectual processes of thinking. And for me, this exhibition is a text. It's not exhibition, I, I have no, um, I'm not, um, I would say that mostly I uh, present myself as a writer, but not as a curator. And this is just the forum with which I'm talking about trauma, because sometimes I even, I, I trying to write a text about this exhibition or like to speak about it. And I cannot uh, write anything that I would be 100% satisfied with it, because all the words seems to me very, um, not correct, I would say. Uh, but with exhibition, it's easier because um, I'm not speaking with my own words. I'm trying to speak with other images, with other experiences. And sometimes this is fills my um, emptiness and like speechless. Of course, I choose all of these works. And this is, but um, the emotional experience, I would say here is more important that, um, uh, vocabulary uh, or like linguistic. Um, so I think in that, yeah, that uh, the main uh, interesting uh, part in Ukrainian art is that um, we have lots of processes that are not sometimes not connected, sometimes connected. But when people meet and they start talking, they find out that they are in the same position and they have similar thoughts and they trying to make something with it and this is also a very interesting thing okay well thank you thank you all for these uh, questions and uh, thank you Katerina, for your answers so uh, probably it is now time uh, to uh, make a transition uh, to our panel. The four participants will have uh, 10 minutes each to present their short papers. And that will uh, follow with, uh, with the discussion. Um, and the first paper is by Mayhil. Uh, Mayhil uh, Fowler, Tessin University, Emotion and the Academic Teaching and researching the Soviet Union during uh, <clears throat> um, during Russia's war in Ukraine. Major, please. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Olga for this invitation. Thank you to Katya, not only for her presentation today, but for um, the work that you've been doing since February. I've read everything you've written, I think. Um, some people might call that stalking, but um, I really appreciated all the texts that you've written, and this is very much inspired by um, some of that. So 
I have three um, hopefully short points um, that I want to make, um, sort of reflecting on, on Katya's work. And the first is very much um, resonating with a piece that Katya wrote in May in an online journal called Eflux, called Ukrainian Rage, um, about emotion. And um, also inspired by Olesya Kromichuk and Sasha Dolzhik's piece in the London Review of Books recently on Ukrainian Cassandras. And this is about the role of emotion. And in this piece, Katya talks about how um, rage is appropriate because it signals injustice, right? And so to feel rage is to actually be aware of injustice. And it does the epistemological work of sort of showing us what's going on. Um, and I think that's right. I think that the emotions that I'm sure we have all been feeling um, alert us to certain realities um, that are important to grapple with. But one thing I've been really thinking about is the role of emotion in academia and universities and the ways that large institutional structures like universities and academia are singularly incapable of handling emotion and the compartmentalization required for those of us working in those institutions and the toll that that takes. Um, you know, shouldn't it be normal for people who work on Ukraine when Russia invades Ukraine to be emotional, but emotions are not proper responses to grant outcomes, to student evaluations, affecting promotions, and framing your professional self when your whole future is actually upside down and needs to be rethought. Institutions don't know what to do. And so I'm really interested in how emotions are shaping this artistic landscape and how that affects artistic institutions, right? Institutions of the arts. I think for academia, it's this a clash between emotions and the institution. And the question is, does our academic field know what to do, right? These are two countries in our field, Russia and Ukraine. It's been very hard since 2014, but now sometimes it seems impossible to go to that field conference. And so um, I think these, these questions of emotions and what we do with them um, is really um, important. Secondly, um, teaching Soviet history um, and the epistemological challenge of that, given the continuity that cannot be ignored between the Soviet um, disregard for individual life and violence and what we see with Russia today. And um, I should just say, I teach at a non-elite school. I teach general survey courses with students who are not history majors. This may be their only contact with the region, their only contact with history. They come in with a certain baggage of, um, uh, uh, we're a very um, Republican state in Florida. So uh, very certain ideas about communism, socialism, it's all bad. Um, uh, their ideas about World War II are that it was exclusively won by the U.S. and the greatest generation. Um, and really what I'm trying to get them to do is to think critically about that, to think about why does healthcare cost so much in the United States? Why are you taking out loans for your college education that you'll spend your adult life repaying? And to really get them to think about socialism in a critical way and think about social justice projects and you know, question their assumptions about World War II. That's what college is about. Question your assumptions, think critically. Um, uh, my course was all about paradox, right? That this was a violent state. We're studying the violence, but we're also studying sort of the mass participatory aspect. But the problem is seeing this direct line, which um, was so apparent this spring when I was teaching Soviet history. And so we hit this midterm project about um, World War II, where they were looking at testimonies by Soviet veterans, which I assigned to them to challenge this World War II greatest generation D-Day narrative, right when Bucha happened. And there was no way to not talk about mass rapes committed by the Soviet army. And I worry that the only thing students took out from that class is reifying and affirming their ideas about the evil empire and communism is bad. <laughs> um, the continuity can't be ignored. Um, in my course, we cover Yalta and Potsdam. In half a class, we read a primary source from the Yalta conference. Suddenly, this idea of Western states deciding Eastern Europe's fate um, could not be ignored, right? The continuity was there. Um, the rolling in of tanks on other states in 56 in Budapest, 68 in Prague, um, can't be ignored, right? And, and in my generation of historians, very much one thing we discussed was how does the regime write itself? How does the Soviet regime write itself after those revolutions? Um, which is a great question. Um, but actually what really struck me was the fear that people must have experienced on those streets when tanks were coming into their beautiful cities. And, um, 
And again, what are students taking away from that? They're taking away sort of the conf confirmation of everything that they brought to the class instead of engaging in the critical thinking. And um, uh, there's more that I could that I could say on that, but I know um, I'm running out of time. And I so I think that that sort of rethinking how I'm teaching to this audience um, is a challenge and one that I'm I'm struggling with. Um, finally, on research, um, a phrase that Katya just said: the words have felt not correct about artists feels very much what I have been experiencing, even though I'm not from Ukraine and I'm not Ukrainian. I've been studying this country for 17 years and my words have felt not correct. Um, I would say um, to try to come up with something to say, I used to think of myself as a Soviet historian of the Soviet project, Ukraine as a case study. And now I feel more a historian of place of this region. Um, here's an example. I'm writing a book on on women in Soviet Ukrainian theater. I do Soviet history, so it's Soviet women. Um, but this summer, I really became interested in my inability to to write, but thinking a lot about um, women who stayed under Nazi occupation during World War II, um, women who left in DP camps and then came to the United States and Canada. Um, I'd maybe always been judgmental of people who stayed under Nazi occupation because I teach the Holocaust and you can't ignore that the Lviv Opera House where there was the first Ukrainian hamlet is a stone's throw from the Yanovska ghetto and, and concentration camp. But the contingency of war became more obvious and I wondered why I hadn't noticed it earlier. And so the Soviet in my book is dissolving more into a story of place about women in this place that is so marked by war and violence and occupation. And I wrote an entire book about the Berezil theater. And it finally occurred to me that that was a theater created after war. Just what Katya is talking about, right? That after the war, how do we envision the world? These were artists who survived World War I and occupation and street warfare. And all of a sudden they're building this theater. And so the Berezil came to me to seem like an after the war um, project. Um, and finally, back to emotion and art and the questions that Katya asked on her first slide that I think are so important. The book on women in war brings us back to emotion and the lack of emotion or keys to the inner landscape in a lot of testimonies and memoirs. The archive is missing. We don't have records of how women dealt with trauma from war in their work. Those records do not exist. The archive isn't there. Um, and that that experience, the bodily experience of war, right? Obviously, um, women aren't writing about that in the 1940s, but how do we as historians try to recapture what that was like and how trauma shaped um, their personal and professional lives? Um, I would also say about theater, there are really no good plays about World War II written during World War II. Um, there is an inability to find words for war, but theater was really important. Um, and theater remained important after the war, unfortunately, I think as a means of often crushing narratives of people's experience of war, right, in the Soviet um, state. But um, I do think one thing we see now is the importance of representation and reflecting and creating work. Um, again, reflecting very much what Katya was just saying, that it's important for artists to create so we don't lose that mechanism of creating. And so that after the war, there will be a possibility of explaining to the world what this experience was and explaining to ourselves what this experience was. Um, so I think that to me, it seems that the process of making art is maybe more important than the product, the artistic product itself. Um, and I would say, I see this, we've heard about the visual art world. I see it in theater as well. It's important for people to be making theater and making plays and telling stories, regardless of the quote unquote quality of, of that work. The important thing is telling the stories so that we can actually tell them and understand what happened later. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mayhew. That was great. Uh, so the next paper by Yulia Ilchu, Stanford University, uh, New Research uh, Opportunities in Slavic Studies. Yulia, please. Thank you, Olga, and thank you, Katerina, for showing us uh, the courage and the spirit uh, to resist the destructive power of the war. Uh, we've been all uh, experiencing the survivor guilt here, um, being unable to physically support uh, our relatives and families and friends over there. I must myself uh, from the Donetsk region, so I totally understand what you experienced. Um, 
So my uh, notes are not really a paper, just uh, what I'm trying to do, how I'm trying to reshape my research and how I'm advising our graduate students who, even in the worst situation, because I've done a lot of research here in Russia and Ukraine and I uh, already published uh, uh, my research, but they're in the stage where, when they need to rethink uh, how to make this uh, uh, new directions. And uh, the project that we are doing together with uh, uh, faculty and uh, students, uh, uh, I will mention the, the today, and uh, I will use as an opportunity to recruit more volunteers for our safe Ukrainian cultural uh, on, online. I also want to mention that Katya Buchatska was my student. And during the class that she took with me, uh, Ukraine at Crossroads, she changed her major to art history. So I'm very proud that uh, the regions and papers that she wrote for my class inspired her for this artwork. So as the Russian army started a full-fledged war in Ukraine, uh, destroying its economy and culture, Western countries, countries promptly condemned the invasion and sanctioned Russia's economy and politi political establishment. But they were not the only targets. Cultural sanctions on the artistic events, exhibitions, performances featuring Russian artists and cultural figures have been restricted and canceled, presenting a moment of reflection for Western Slavists to revise their curriculum and research areas of the Russian uh, Slavic studies, historically dominated by Russian studies. At Stanford, I was lucky to have an opportunity to teach a variety of courses on Ukraine and Eastern Europe, so I didn't need to make a lot of adjustments, but I can see how my graduate students and colleagues have to make uh, uh, adjustments in their research plans in this uncertain situation of the prolonged war. The war also affects Ukrainian uh, studies uh, with no access to archives and research institutions. Uh, the majority of our PhD in history were doing uh, research in uh, the KGB archives and uh, they're basically stuck with the dissertation uh, writing. So I predict a considerable decline of interest in the field among especially graduate students uh, if we won't offer new major tracks, diversify our curriculum and teach them new research skills. Uh, I will, if uh, I'm allowed, I wanna share my screen to show the project that we collaborate with students and colleagues. Can you see? Uh, I hope you've seen uh, some, some of the um, call for memes or call for papers uh, for, for this uh, uh, collaborative decision. So one new type of project is uh, data rescue. And uh, what uh, uh, me and uh, uh, other 1600 volunteers doing for this project um, started as a spontaneous and unstructured model of collaboration. On March 1st, my colleague uh, in digital uh, Tech assistant uh, Win uh, Dombrowski, Anna Kias of Tufts University, and Sebastian Maestrovich of the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities. Um, they exchanged uh, on Twitter the idea on March 1st, and this is the date when we started collecting uh, artifacts and memes uh, and uh, putting them uh, on, on the gallery. Um, so the project evolved from this kind of uh, ad hoc, chaotic uh, um, collaboration uh, to more methodical selection of the materials. As of today, uh, it engages more than 1,300 volunteers in 31 channels, so meaning like 31 directions of research from all, all over the world, from librarians, teachers, historians, graduate students who web archived more than 5,000 websites of 50 tetrabyte of data uh, of uh, extinguished cultural institutions, museums, libraries, but also those under direct attack uh, right now. So skills that my graduate students acquire in helping collect and process information for Sucho include data scrapping and writing custom code to capture material that is difficult to gather with automated tools. The usual images exhibited in the gallery and you can direct your students to work on the gallery uh, and device them, device uh, assignments uh, with this uh, uh, 
art objects. Um, so this uh, materials can be used for further annotation and storytelling in the courses on Ukrainian history and culture and politics. Another collection uh, is uh, our memes, meme wall. So this is already uh, grouped in on, on the themes, but not annotated. So I envision this uh, as a material for advanced language uh, learning and studies of alternative media during the war. Uh, we cannot underestimate the power of pop culture and promoting cultural awareness uh, in teaching such subtleties of sarcasm and stop as a tool of overcoming the anxiety and fear during the war, and also as a, a mechanism of creating a global community. So if you have anyone who can volunteer with their time, uh, we are seeking not only advanced uh, programmers, but also translators. Uh, I myself help to translate tutorials for Ukrainian librarians. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of time, but uh, the team is really appreciated uh, of having those with native Ukrainian skills. So let me just stop sharing. So the data science and visualization of, of new data are one of the research methods that can be universally applied in both Ukrainian and Russian courses. In the time when traveling to the archives, neither in Russia or Ukraine is feasible, students feel they are doing meaningful original research when they actively get the data, be it the factory sounds and music generated by Chernobyl. I had one ethnomusicologist who collected the database of such sounds and annotated them, or local party proceedings uh, in deciding how to liquidate uh, the negative effect of the Chernobyl nuclear power dis disaster. So it was also a collaborative project of uh, history students who mapped uh, these uh, decisions uh, in the kind of network uh, shape, or also mapping the effect of the ongoing war. So collecting and analyzing data cannot replace archival research, but ultimately can complement it with the focus on finding hidden, hidden patterns and hidden influences uh, in the decision-making. In my own research, I made a major move from studying post-Soviet Russian and Ukrainian culture from the comparative angle, to prioritize in Ukraine as a self-sufficient autonomous culture. I'm still curious about the parallel processes of, of identity formation and memory politics in post-Soviet societies, but I decided to postpone any Russia-related research until the war is over. So in my new uh, book project, uh, which I uh, retitled uh, Into the Vanished, Temporality, identity, and memory in post Euromaidan uh, Ukraine. I trace the major changes in Ukrainian civic identity and memory politics through the analysis of prose fiction, poetry, film, and uh, art exhibitions uh, uh, created in the aftermath of the revolution of dignity, and especially during the ongoing invasion of Russia into Ukraine. The mass destruction of Ukraine's cities and communities during the war have found an acute resonance with the collective memory of the traumatic Soviet past uh, in Ukrainian society. After the revolution of dignity, Ukrainian society began undermining the competitive framework of national memory and overcoming the rivalry between national Ukrainian traumas and the traumas of other people of Ukraine, including Roma, Crimean, Tatars, and Jews. The policies of decommunization, general openness of the society to the suffering of others, coupled with the opening of the KGB archives and establishing research institutions studying the Holocaust, provided Ukrainian intellectuals with new historical material to write on the contested memory of World War II. And if you look at the publications of major Ukrainian writers, uh, Andrei Kurkov, Maria Matilas, Oksana Zabushka, Sofia Andrukhovich, they all drew material from the uh, archives uh, and very often the new novels look like uh, the assemblage of uh, historical data with fictional uh, stories. Uh, so what, what, what happened uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in this uh, interwar period, which I call 2014 and the present, that instead of narrativizing the past, 
in traditional literary genres and in traditional historiographical tradition, the post-2014 cultural production in Ukraine prioritized documenting the truth, which resulted in the boom of documentary genres, including docu-fiction, autobiographical fiction, oral histories and memoirs, docu-theater, photography, multimedia projects. A new idea of cultural memory as interconnected, multi-directional, multi and transgressing the national memories borders has been channeled in the variety of literary and artistic production. One way to see these changes in memory culture in Ukraine is through literature written by and about refugee writers. Memory on the move or memory of the displaced persons is realized uh, in different literary texts. Uh, forced displacements during World War II and during the ongoing war in Ukraine has united the fates of people of multi-ethnic background and shifted attention from the dominant discourse of national memory to the memory of traumatized subjects. Displaced literature and art transcends categorization and undermines the assumption that memory of a nation must be homogeneous. The experience of Ukrainian refugees and their memory work complements and complicates the existing literature on the Middle Eastern and other refugees, since unlike the, uh, the latter, the former Ukrainian refugees are racial and culturally more homogeneous, and therefore they faster integrate in their new European communities. Most of the Ukrainian poets uh, whom I translate and analyze in my book uh, nowadays serve as cultural ambassadors in their new host communities, organizing translation projects, participated in uh, poetry reading, connecting uh, translators with uh, Polish, uh, Lithuanian, and other writers. Uh, so um, this, uh, all this uh, new uh, literary and artistic production all can be uh, new directions for uh, not only scholars, but also graduate students. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Well, uh, Julia, thank you so much for your very interesting talk. And uh, uh, the next paper is my own, uh, introducing students uh, to the tropes of resistance and resilience in Ukraine and uh, Like my colleagues, I would like to start with the emotional impact on the war and proceed uh, the pedagogical challenges and opportunities. Uh, of course, my experience was nothing like Katarina's, but even in faraway Canada, one could go sleep when constantly checking the news from Ukraine. And this emotional stress uh, found its expression in my uh, changing attitude to some of the topics I teach. I have also noticed that students saw them differently as well. We all know that Russia's aggression against Ukraine didn't start in February. The war uh, in the Donbass has been going on since uh, spring 2014. But the massive invasion, uh, which uh, began uh, in February, changed the optics of the war. Uh, it suddenly became more like uh, World War II, not just um, in the use of firepower, but also in the mounting military losses. And of course, there were also mass uh, atrocities against uh, Ukrainian civilians uh, that Canada now recognizes as genocide. It is interesting uh, that my immediate reaction was rejection of a Stalinist movie about World War II, The Fall of Berlin of 1949, which I had to teach on February 26. Uh, and this reaction came at four levels. First, uh, I just couldn't face the scenes of uh, war um, featuring tanks, airplanes, and bombs explosions. Second, uh, I wasn't prepared to see the, civilian, uh, the civilians being killed um, and wounded uh, 
And uh, the third, I couldn't stand the big lie. This Stalinist film is all about the wise and magnificent uh, dictator who, who directs not just the huge armies, but even the personal lives of uh, the uh, main protagonists. Of course, there is nothing in the film about achieving victories uh, at a huge cost. Uh, because soldiers' lives didn't matter to the dictators. Uh, and uh, nothing, uh, about, uh, in, nothing about even the Red Army or Trust uh, um, on, on their way to Berlin. And um, particularly uh, nothing about the mass rape of German women. Uh, there were just too many parallels parallels with the present. Uh, and finally, uh, at the fourth level, uh, there was the setting. The early scenes of the uh, fall of Berlin are set uh, at a large steel mill in a southern city where at least one uh, notable film character speaks Ukrainian. And uh, it is not difficult to guess the location. The Donbass and the Azovstal steel mill in the city of Mariupol. And, and this year, these names became uh, so familiar to everybody in the world. But for me, Mariupol always will be the place of uh, my childhood uh, summers, uh, summer vacations, uh, and uh, just like that, the, the city of my childhood. Um, and I have uh, contemplated asking my uh, department chair for an, an ex kind of an exemption, uh, allowing me not to teach this class in person uh, and just post the recorded lecture from one of the previous years. Moreover, uh, my department chair kindly offered uh, on her own initiative that I skip some classes and post the recordings. But at the end, but in the end, um, I decided that the best strategy would be opening up to my students. Uh, that was the day when every single of them showed up and as it was for quiz and I understood that was support for me. Um, we had an unusual discussion in which the uh, in the nation of war and totalitarianism um, and totalitarian propaganda crossed the boundaries of time and space. Uh, and um, on the initiative of uh, some students, the class ended with a big group hug. Uh, the course on Stalinist cinema um, is uh, going to resonate very differently when I teach it next time for sure. But this is also true uh, about my other courses. My beginner Ukrainian uh, did include a brief discussion about the Russian-speaking Ukrainians and then the, the nature of modern Ukrainian identity. Uh, this section will need it to be expanded because Putin had used the Russian speakers as a per, um, kind of pretext for, um, for his invasion. Uh, the importance of the Ukrainian language for the Ukrainian society has also changed drastically in the last few months. Most important, uh, it is now impossible to prepare Canadian students uh, to conduct basic conversation with Ukrainians without um, teaching them the words which became symbol of resistance. Uh, this is the first one is uh, Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, and Peranitsa, a bread loaf, but also the word uh, notoriously difficult to pronounce for Russian speakers. Uh, and uh, the word, the world famous um, in the English version as well as uh, in the original Russian, Russian worship, go at yourself. Uh, the latter became a powerful symbol of Ukrainian resistance 
even though it was said in Russian rather than in Ukrainian. Uh, the section about Maidan, Kiev's main square, will need to be updated too, uh, not just because it remains uh, kind of fortified against a potential Russian uh, landing party, but also because uh, the, there are the ceremonies for many fallen heroes are now taking place. Um, in general, beginning Ukrainian will become more relevant uh, to Canadian students because of the Ukrainian refugees arriving uh, in Canada. The course I am planning to develop on the Ukrainian-Canadian experience will also need to include a significant component uh, on the displaced Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainian-Canadian uh, community has now uh, refocused its attention on helping them, on helping refugees. And there are hundreds of displaced, Ukrainian, displaced Ukrainians uh, living on Vancouver Island my other courses on, on Eastern Europe will need to undergo a kind of a decolonization. Together with students, uh, I will need to re-examine the texts and fields we study in order to see where the imperial narrative uh, suppressed Ukrainian agency and how we can recover it. Every time a cultural product uh, implies superiority of imperial culture over kind of uneducated peasants or uncivilized Cossacks. Uh, we would need to dig deeper and call it what it is, a colonialism. Of course, this is not just about Ukraine and Ukrainians, but, but Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine gave our field a new impetus. Uh, uh, for re-examining the way of we teach. Um, it also gave us a responsibility for educating our students as critical thinkers and passionate uh, humanitarians. Together, we will need to look for a new ways of meeting this challenge. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now, the final uh, short paper by Sergei Yekelchik, uh, The End of Post-Soviet History. Thank you very much. Uh, it's going to be a really short paper, I promise. Um, and I'm like many historians of Ukraine, Russia, and the Soviet Union, and that of Eastern Europe as well. I'm finding myself in a situation in which uh, my teaching and actually the textbooks I use, um, and I also write textbooks, will need to reflect what is widely understood to be a major sea change. Um, there have been some interesting attempts. Um, to define this sea change, which happened with the beginning of an all out Russian invasion on February 24th. Francis Fukuyama, once famous for proclaiming the end of history, went public to say that history was back now. Um, he meant it in a sense of ideology, in a sense of the Cold War and the competition uh, between the two great powers. Uh, it seems to me something is missing here. Ukraine and the Ukrainian-Russian relations. There was also an attempt by a prominent literary scholar in the United States, uh, Kevin Platt, uh, to proclaim that the post-Soviet period is over. Um, Kevin meant it in a sense of uh, no more transition or even a prospect of transition from, from something to something in Russian history. Um, and also in a sense of Russia positioning itself again against the West. So in a sense, the end of post-Soviet for him is a return to the Soviet period. And that's what he says as well. Again, Ukraine seems to be missing here. Um, then if you just basically look at what 
factors we could pick up as marking this C change, um, something becomes clear. The first one is actually war, the war itself. But it's not really the first war um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Of course, the war, the Karabakh conflict, which started even before the Soviet Union ended. There was the Russian war on Georgia in 2008, a conflict in Transnistria in the early 1990s. The list goes on. So the war itself, or even Russia trying to recover the former republic, is not novel in, in this context. Well, then perhaps the so-called, uh, the, the choice of Europe, and Europe has to be in quotation marks here, the Ukrainian choice of Europe uh, could be seen as the factor uh, determining this new space and new time. And of course, Europe has to be in quotation marks because it is imagined as basically a metaphor for uh, the rule of law, and democracy, the lack of corruption and good prosperous life, which is not always what Europe is or the European Union is, but this is how it is being used in the Ukrainian political discourse. It functions this way. Well, but then if you look at the history uh, since the end of the Soviet Union, Ukraine would not be the first. The Baltic countries, the Baltic states, uh, early on, even before the Soviet collapse, really openly proclaimed their European orientation, and they were also the first ones to join the European uh, Union and the NATO, the first ones from among the former Soviet republics. So that would, again, uh, not be a good marker. Uh, so our search for a good marker, then, would have to go back to something which is curiously absent in uh, new conceptualizations and quantifications about the end of something. And that would be Ukraine itself. Um, so I think the crucial consideration for making sense of this new period in history and in culture too, is the importance of Ukraine for Russia. Yes, there have been wars. Yes, there have been declarations of us being Europe and not being part of um, Russian civilization or anything like that, not being part of post-Soviet space. But these declarations came from the former republics that were not as crucial to Russia's own notion of itself. And I don't mean here the strategic considerations which some political scientists would bring into this picture and unknowingly, unwittingly play into Mr. Putin's hands because that's precisely the explanation he likes. It's all about the NATO invading the Russian security uh, space. Um, I mean, something else. Um, so Ukraine is important for the very notion of the Russian identity because it can undermine the empire extremely effectively, not in the way the Baltic states would ever be able to, or even the Caucasus as such. Um, and of course, then that becomes a replay of 1991, because that's precisely how the Soviet period ended before now the post-Soviet period ended. Because the Soviet period ended precisely because Ukraine said no to the continued existence of the Soviet Union. So that um, brings us to the point of having to actually seriously look into the Russian-Ukrainian relations and what they tell us about Russia and Ukraine. And there are many points that can be made there. One, an obvious one, is of course um, the efficiency of Ukrainian challenge to the empire, because the empire cannot really exist without the Ukrainian resources, or so the empire prefers to think. And but the empire cannot really exist without Ukrainians too, because they are seen as part of the Russian ethnic group, the greater Russian nation, by the Tsars as well as by Mr. Putin. And so it's a challenge on two fronts, to Russian ethnic identity, which remains undeveloped because it is too imperial, and to Russia's identity as a regional, and ideally, they would like to think of themselves as a global power. Ukraine challenges both of them. Well, then, haven't I just arrived to the confirmation of Mr. Fukuyama's theory that history is back? Well, history is back. But it's the history in which 
the Soviet Union is no longer a paradigm which helps us to explain what is happening. Instead, the paradigm is the empire and decolonization. And so the Ukrainian experience and Russian history now needs to be resought. Um, and, and emphasis in textbooks need to be switched to the moments of interaction, to the moments of suppressing Ukrainian agency, to the moments of uh, effectively spreading stereotypes about Ukrainians, like Olga has said previously. And that, of course, also explains why the present cultural policies in Ukraine and notable developments in Ukrainian uh, politics of memory are not really longer about decommunization. Of course, that was the original 2015 project of separating themselves from Russia. But in a way, uh, the very term decommunization positioned it as a separation from the Soviet period. And that view is now, has now been overtaken by another one for which I have argued. Um, actually, in an interview, um, Katya recorded with me. And that was the moment when I met <laughs> Katya as a journalist in her capacity as a journalist, when she recorded that interview where I argued for, for the colonial angle rather than a decommunization angle. And so that explains why now there is an attempt to get rid of the place names that reflect Russian imperial domination throughout the centuries. And that also explains why in Ukraine, the notion of democracy, which is affiliated with the metaphor of Europe, the European Union, is now also an anti-imperial notion which is projected into history, into acts of anti-colonial resistance. And that allows us not only to take um, an exciting new uh, interpretation of the Ukrainian past and present, uh, in which the idea of Ukraine is connected to the idea of fighting against the empire and fighting for democracy, fighting for something defined as Europe. Uh, but it also allows us to uh, define what, what, what kind of teaching is going to be needed for that. Um, and so in, in, in a way, like Olga has said, really, it needs to be a participatory exercise in which we open up to our students about our position on this um, struggle, um, ask them to think of what is important to them, and why it is important for all of us to support Ukraine in its heroic uh, resistance against the Russian onslaught. And this would actually remove lots of ideological falsehoods accumulated around this conflict and some aggrandizing uh, presentations of, uh, of, of, of uh, political theorists who thought they were always right. Um, and return the agency to the two important groups we really want to protect and cherish. One, of course, is the Ukrainian people, and the second one, our students. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Sergei. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and let's see if we have um, any questions from the audience. Uh, Alicia, please. Hi. Um, we don't have any audience. Oh, yes. Uh, Katerina, please. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a very uh, uh, problematic question right now, but which is striking lots of Ukrainians how to speak about decolonization in the Ukrainian case. Uh, could we, uh, because for me, for example, the how I uh, defined it, um, I'm thinking that in 90s, we have this post-colonial uh, processes that have been done in Ukrainian literary uh, critic as well, and by writers, but now it's not about something that post some historical processes, 
but this part of decolonization means to rethink all this historical background and to like completely maybe change our understanding of some um, issues in our history. But I don't know, I don't have much um, uh, text, uh, theoretical text on it. And also uh, I'm always um, fights with especially European colleagues who completely didn't see uh, this issue in the historical uh, art critics perspective and so on. Yeah, I, I guess I guess I am the one to answer or to to try and answer this question. But maybe Mayhill would be uh, would like to jump in first. Or is it a question you have? No, I actually wanted to answer Katja's question um, and start a conversation about it because I think it's really important um, that we 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 talk about decolonization a lot. There's a lot of talk of decolonization, and I think concretizing exactly what we mean is really important. Um, and to Katya's point, one thing that um, Oksana Dudko said in a To Me interview with Irina Sarovoit and Volodya Bechlo was that actually the Ukraine case helps us rethink big theories. And so actually this problem of like, what do we do with some of this literature that doesn't quite seem to work for us is the point, right? Um, and, and Katya, there was a there was a Zoom talk that you were on um, uh, that was held in Germany with a um, German um, art historian, perhaps visual studies scholar. Um, now I sound very stocky. And um, you made this great intervention about all of the Ukrainian scholars who have actually written on decolonization and written on the post-colonial experience. And so there is like a body of work in Ukraine and there is thinking done on that. And so I think, taking that all more, more seriously. And I think for, for me in my work, it's very much something that Serhi was just talking about, about what does it do if you put Ukraine at the center? Like, how does that change the picture? And um, if you don't see the teleology of kind of, um, you know, growth of Russia, demise of the Soviet Union, through Russia, if you put Ukraine at the center, you end up with slightly different stories. And so I think it's this kind of switching of, of what is the center, what is the periphery. Um, and I think also just in telling different stories and in telling them powerfully, you implicitly decolonize, right? One of the one of the things that um, Soviet kind of narrative said was Ukraine is Ukrainians, right? Soviet nationality policy. And so implicitly to sort of talk about, as, as uh, Yulia was saying, you know, Jews in Ukraine and the diversity in Ukraine and multi-ethnicity in Ukraine is implicitly a decolonizing project, actually, because it's actually a resistance to this narrative that was imposed from the Imperial Center. Um, so those are just some of my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, I agree completely uh, with what you said, Mayhew. Um, and actually I'm trying to remember whether it was in the same interview or um, in another one I gave that same year to BBC where there was a warning about um, decolonization being seen potentially as a universal excuse um, because it would need to come with a critical assessment of what in fact Ukrainians have done for the empire and they have done a lot to build the Russian empire and created its ideology. So it's a curious position, which is somewhere between the position of Scotland uh, towards England and the position of Ireland towards England. And these of course are not classical cases either. And there is some really interesting scholarship on, on the Irish case in particular, whether the notion of decolonization is applicable there and if so, in what way. But I wanted to start my answer with completely different, on a completely different leg. Um, so I will end it uh, with that comment now. Exhibits like the one uh, Kata has organized in her apartment, precisely the powerful way to make uh, the Ukrainian voices heard. And also 
uh, it allows um, the viewer, it's done in such a non-invasive way really, that it allows the viewer to uh, decide what emotional response is needed in this case and what intellectual response is needed in this case, because it is in a way open-ended and it's not just about war and the value of life and the um, tenacity of everyday things and it's about everything. It's about what you uh, read into it. And so it actually allows this space, the discursive space for fighting the empire and fighting the war and fighting for humanity the way you imagine it, really. So that was what I was going to say, but Mayhu, you are completely right. I agree with you. Any other audience questions, anyone? No. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for the wonderful and productive discussion uh, and uh, to our audience for participating uh, this event. Uh, our thoughts are with heroic defenders of Ukraine, Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to Katya. Thank you so much. Well, so goodbye to everybody, I guess. And uh, yes, see you. Okay.